you have your Bibles and you would open them, please, with me, to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. 1 Corinthians 13. We'll begin at verse number 8, and we will read through verse number 12. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12. And the word of the Lord today reads from the King James text. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Amen. I want to talk to us today on the topic, People Change. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Father, today, God, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for the word of God. It is indeed today the bread of life. Master, we need the Holy Ghost to break down and to disseminate the Word of God by reason of your Spirit. We need you, Lord, to anoint the speaker. We need you, God, to touch the ear of every hearer. For, Lord, communication is not a one-way street. It is not all reliant upon the one that speaks, but it also relies upon the one that hears. Help me to communicate clearly that which the Spirit would have me to communicate. And help the hearer today, God, to crisply, cleanly, purely hear what the Spirit of God is trying to communicate to the church at this hour. We need a word from God. We need a word from heaven. Lord, the church for too long has had words that came from men's imaginations. We need a word from God. Pour out your Spirit upon us, Lord, as the word of God goes forth. Send your word to heal, to save, to deliver. For we ask it in none other than Jesus Wonderful, precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. People change. One of the most enduring mysteries of the human condition has rested in the eternal question, can people change? Many people question whether or not a cheating spouse, for instance, has the ability to change. We all know people who are habitual, constant liars. And we often wonder, can a liar change? Can they stop lying and learn to speak the truth? Can an an individual who is abusive to his wife or to his children, to his spouse or to her spouse, can they change? Can they learn to stop being abusive? Can a selfish person become more giving? 
one of the biggest looming questions in the human condition is, can people change? The Word of God provides in our primary text today a simple and clear answer to this age-old question, stating it frankly, yes, people change. Say, Pastor, the primary text today didn't say anything at all about people changing. Oh, yes, it did. As the Apostle Paul in the 13th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians is addressing the issue of love, it is to, it, the word that is used in uh, the King James text is charity. Charity meaning love in action. That's why we say, you know, we give to charities. What are charities? Charities are uh, organizations that have taken love and concern for our fellow human being and put it into action. So we support charities. We support love in action. That's what charity means. But in our primary text today, the Apostle Paul is talking about the unfailing, unwavering nature of love. He said, charity never fails. This does not mean when it says fails, it does not mean as in the sense of is unsuccessful. That's not what the term fail here means. Just like in the Old Testament it talks about the widow woman and how that her oil and her meal never failed. Well obviously it wasn't trying to be successful in anything. But it means simply that it never ceased. It never stopped. It, the supply was constant. And Paul says in our primary text today that one of the most wonderful attributes of love is that love never runs out of supply. Hallelujah. That God always has love. There's always love. The Word of God tells us that God is love. And because God is love, there is never a want, there is never a lacking for love when it comes to God. He says, but where there's things like prophecy, where there are things like tongues, where there are things today like knowledge. And when he uses the term knowledge, he means, uh, you know, incremental revelation and incremental understanding you go to school to study and to learn you start out in kindergarten you go all the way up to 12th grade all through the process there's knowledge but it's incremental as you go up a grade the level of knowledge increases the level of teaching increases so you learn more and ultimately you know more and he said, where there's knowledge, where there's a need to incrementally learn and grow in our knowledge and in our understanding and in our revelation. He said, these things eventually are going to no longer be necessary. They, they won't even, we're not even going to need a supply of them because we'll have all we need. He said, whether there be tongues, they'll cease. Whether there be prophecy, it'll fail. It'll, it'll run out. Why? Well, because Jesus is coming. Hallelujah. The saints of God are one day going to stand before the Lord and we'll no longer need prophecy. We'll no longer need the Spirit of the Lord speaking to the church uh, through prophets and through those who are operating in the prophetic. We'll no longer need tongues and interpretation. We'll no longer need incremental knowledge because at that point, we're going to know everything we need to know. Hallelujah. We're going to graduate. Aren't you glad today that one day all the things in this life that caused you trouble and struggle, depression, and, and, and just caused you to become so... Uh, desperate are going to be fully understood 
you're going to be able one day to look back and there'll be no questions. There'll be no hurt. The Word of God said that God is going to wipe away all the tears from His people's eyes in glory. And I think that job's going to be easy because when you wipe away hurt, then there's no need for tears. Hallelujah. When you wipe away pain, there's no need for tears. When you wipe away death, there's no need for tears. When you wipe away sorrow, there's no need for tears. But Paul, in talking in our primary text today, is talking about the fact that Things are going to change after the return of the Lord. When the Lord comes, things are going to be very different. He then uses an illustration. And he says, when I was a child, I thought as a child. I understood as a child. I spake as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Got news for you, people change. Paul's talking about change. He's talking about the fact that after the rapture, after the redemption of the church, we're going to be changed. Our circumstance is going to be changed. Our situation is going to be changed. Our knowledge and our understanding is going to be changed. And he compares it to being a child. He said, and as a child, you know, you speak like a child. You think like a child. You understand like a child. He said, but when you become a man, you put away child things change. Let me rephrase that. Things should change. There are many full-grown adults running around our world today who are still as childish and immature in their thinking as any little baby. We just had a, a monster in the White House who was the most childish, immature, asinine, ridiculous human being that I've ever watched and I've ever laid eyes on in my life. His conduct and his behavior was like that of a three-year-old at best. So there are adults who don't change. There are people who grow up and they don't change. But you know, the interesting thing about change is, as human beings... It's always reliant, listen to me children, it is always reliant upon growth, increased knowledge, and maturity. As you grow, and you increase in knowledge, and you mature, things change, people change. I'm ashamed to say this today, but I've told you many times. I try to be transparent. I, I don't keep secrets about myself just to try to make myself look better. I want people to understand that this preacher identifies with you, my fellow believer, because I am, just like you, a fellow believer. And I've had struggles in life, and I've had troubles trying to uh, get some issues under my belt as I grew up and as I matured. And one of the areas in my life that I used to be terrible in when I was a younger person was finances. I was absolutely horrendous when it came to money. Now, there might be a lot of people who would have observed me and they would had all kinds of reasons for why, and I'm sure they would apply all kinds of uh, malicious reasons and nasty reasons for why I did certain things a certain way. But the truth of the matter is, I really just never had a very good education growing up when it came to finances. I do not speak this to chide my parents or anything like that. I think a lot of parents in our world today uh, do a poor job of uh, 
teaching their children about priorities financially and teaching their children about the importance of credit and the importance of paying your bills and which uh, expenses are priorities and learning to say no to yourself. Just because just you want something doesn't mean you have to have it, you know. And uh, my mother grew up rather poor, and I remember my mother telling me years ago, she said when she was a kid, she learned uh, when she'd see something that she really wanted, you know, a, a doll or some toy or something, she said, I learned to just ask myself, do you really, really need it? Is it something you need, or is it just something you want? And when she was able to do that, she was able to determine, well, it's really just just a want, it's not a need. So if it's just a want, I can live without it. Amen. But you know, a lot of parents, I don't know very many parents that sit down with their kids when they were paying bills and writing checks and said, okay, now Tommy, you sit here, daddy and I are paying the bills. We're writing checks to the electric company. You see, daddy goes to work and he makes this much money. And then we have to pay to have electricity. We have to pay to have water. We have to pay to have uh, uh, gas for heat and what have you. And then show your child, you know, what these things cost and show them how the money that comes in then has to go out and by the time you're done, you're left with this much and now I have to buy groceries and uh, I'm going to spend no more than this. You know what I'm saying? It, it's it's tedious work and, and it really requires a very concerted effort to do this. I don't know very many parents that did it. Now, there, your parents may have done that. Mine did not. My father worked a factory job. He made good money. He made very good money. He was an ambitious man for all of his warts uh, and all of his faults. He was an ambitious man. And he frequently was out doing odd jobs for people, you know. And he would make money doing other types of work, electrical work, painting, uh, carpentry, you name it, plumbing. He was a jack of all trades and master of none. And so he, he always seemed to have money on him. But my father was an immature man. He also loved his toys. I hate to say it, but he loved his toys more than he loved his family. You know, he liked certain cars. He liked certain stereos. He liked certain this and certain that. And so my father was constantly out spending money. So I grew up thinking money comes in. What's rent? What's water bills? What's electric? What are credit cards? No, you just go out and spend it. That's how you're supposed to do. You know, you just spend it. And that's how I viewed finances. It took me a long time till I finally, listen to me, finally grew up. And I finally matured. And I finally, of my own accord, a reason of life experience and exposure to certain information, till I was finally able to get my priorities right and get everything, you know, set so that I was able to understand how everything works. It took me a long time. I'm embarrassed to say that, but it did. It took me a long time. But you see, change is consistent with and reliant upon maturity. Mm -hmm. Paul said, when I was a child, I understood this way. I thought this way. I spoke this way. But when I became a man... I put away childish things. Well, that's how it's supposed to work. Not everybody does that. Many people carry into their adult life their childhood. They, can, they come into adulthood still thinking like a little kid. I have a great uncle that I loved dearly. I love this man immensely. He, he was a blast to be around uh, back in the day. He was so much fun. He was funny and entertaining, and I loved this uncle. There was something about him. He's been my inspiration my whole life to want to be a good uncle to my nephews and my nieces because my uncle was a blast. He was just fun. If he showed up at a family gathering, you knew you are going to laugh. You knew he was going to have funny stories to tell, and he was going to tell them funny. 
I can't count how many times I have conversations with my uncle, great uncle, in which he crabbed and complained about the fact that his mother, my great-grandmother, had taken him away from the state in which he grew up as a child until he was about five. And she had taken him away from that state and moved to another state where her daughter and my grandmother lived and her husband and family. She went there so that she could be a help. My grandmother had ten kids. Of course, she didn't have them all at once, but, you know, over the course of time. She wanted to be able to help my grandmother and my grandfather with their children but she also needed work. Her husband, my great-grandfather, had divorced her, went off and married another woman in short order, and she was suddenly a single mother, and we're talking about folks way back in the 1950s, okay? She needed work. She needed a way to support herself and to support her son. But, you know... She also needed the support of her children. She needed emotional support. She needed to be close to family. Her daughter and son-in-law and children had moved a state away. It wasn't that far. It was about a state away, about a three or four hour drive. But they had moved and her other daughter had done the same. And, and so long story short, my great-grandmother took her young son and moved one state to a to Connecticut where I grew up and my uncle my great uncle begrudged her this till the day he died he was in his late 70s he died I believe at about 80 Tommy and I went to visit him one time not too long ago and uh, we were visiting with him a year or so before he passed before this COVID mess settled in. And he once again brought up, you know, how upset he was that his mother had taken him away from Massachusetts and brought him to Connecticut as a kid. And he wasn't able to be close to his father and blah, 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 you know, and all this negativity and all this... And I had heard that story from him many, many times growing up. Tommy, when in the world was my dear beloved uncle ever going to grow up? When was he ever going to mature? When was he ever going to stop talking like a child? When was he ever going to stop thinking as a child? When was he ever going to stop understanding as a child? When was he ever going to change? Because the only way he was going to change was if he put away these childish things. Am I telling the truth? When was that going to happen? Or was it ever going to happen? Well, i got news for you. In his lifetime, it never happened. You would try to talk to him, and you would offer him reasoning. You see, a lot of times, people who are not in the fray are able to offer you uh, some explanations and reasons uh, because they are emotionally detached from that situation. And a mature person, a grown-up person, learns that sometimes the feedback you receive from a third party, from somebody who wasn't there, somebody who uh, was not emotionally invested in the situation, and sometimes those who were, like, for instance, his own sister. His own sister, my grandmother, said to my uncle many times, well, but, you know, mom needed work. She needed a good paying job. I needed help with the kids, you know. She needed to be close to family. She, had, she didn't have family anymore. She was divorced, you know. Uh, this in the 50s, for crying out loud, things were different. And for all of that input, he just ignored all that and, and never put away his childish thinking. He never put away his childish understanding. He never put away his childish speech. He talked at 80 the way he did when he was 5 about this issue. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? I'll tell you, it's awful sad 
bringing this into a spiritual application, it's awful sad when there are people of God who are no more mature, no more understanding, no more intelligent in spiritual things than they were the day they came into the church. The day they learned of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The day that they submitted themselves to the faith. And as the years go by, Tommy, they still think the way they did way back when. They still talk the way they did way back then. They still understand things the way they did way back then. Because spiritually, it's also necessary that we change. It's also necessary that spiritually we grow and we develop and we mature. Things should not be today the same as they were yesterday. I love the idiotic reasoning that people give me for remaining the same childish, foolish person today in the faith that they were yesterday. Without fail, they'll go to Hebrews 13, 8 and 9. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Yes, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, I have a right to be stuck like a, a mammoth in a tar pit. I have a right to think today the same identical way I thought yesterday. To talk today the same identical way I talked yesterday. To understand today the same way. No, 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 no. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, honey. If you become the same yesterday, today, and forever, there's only one way to be the same yesterday as you were today. There's only one way. You, you got to be dead. Because if you're alive, your skin cells are shedding. They say, you know, every so often your whole body in effect has been renewed and you have a whole new body because after all, your cells have regenerated and replaced themselves. Things change. You get older. You know, I look at my face in the mirror these days and I get so disgusted with these lines under my eyes. I think, Lord, wasn't that many years ago I didn't have these old lines under my eyes make me look so tired all the time. I didn't have all these creases in my forehead you know make me look like uh, you know I've got elephant skin up there on my forehead I didn't always have this belly I didn't always have these certain traits am I telling the truth no but people change part of it's just getting older part of it's just... so therefore if you want to not change at all and you want to remain absolutely consistent the only way you can achieve that is to die. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Outside of me, you can do nothing. If you're not plugged into the vine, honey, then you have no source of life and you're going to die. Mm -hmm. The Bible said that if a, if a branch is not producing fruit, what do you do? You hewn it off and you cast it into the fire. It's dead. You cut it off and throw it in the fire. So therefore, if you're in the vine, then you've got life. If you're in the vine, then you're growing. If you're in the vine, then you're bearing fruit. If you're in the vine, you are changing. Oh, but Paul said not to be carried about with divers, doctrines, and, and all these things. Well, of course he said that. You need to be established in your understanding. You need to be established. There are certain basics of the gospel that are absolutely mandatory to salvation. The Word of God tells us what those absolutely mandatory essentials are. You must believe that Jesus Christ uh, 
died and rose again on the third day, you must believe that. The Bible tells us that we must believe that if we confess, believe in our heart and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead. We must believe those things. There are many doctrines out there. There are many cults out there. There are many teachers out there who would try to make you question these things. Did Jesus really physically rise from the dead? Why, the Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you, no, he did not. His body evaporated. It disappeared. And he simply was reappeared to uh, his disciples in a spiritual form. He reappeared to them in a new form. No, that's not what the Bible said. Last week we... Uh, read the passage in which the Apostle Paul said that Jesus Christ was resurrected. He then he even used the word, he said, and revived. Well, if you revive somebody who's dead, if you revive somebody on the floor, falls down with a heart attack, and you revive them, honey, got news for you. Uh, their body doesn't just disappear, and all of a sudden a new figure appeared. No, you revive. That means you bring life back to that which was dead. Jesus Christ physically, literally rose from the dead. That is essential to the faith. But if you think because you were born at First Baptist Church and you were dedicated at First Baptist Church, if you think because mommy uh, and daddy baptized you Catholic and, and, or because you were christened in a Methodist church, if you think that you have all the answers and every doctrine and every truth of God's Word is yours simply because you started your journey in this particular denomination or this particular organization, you are very foolish. No, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. I spoke as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. There comes a time in your life when Someone may present to you a truth from God's Word. Someone may present to you something from the Word of God that you now must weigh and you must balance it in your mind and you must uh, pray about it and ask the Lord to help you understand it. Lord, is this truth or is this not truth? It's not what I was taught as a kid growing up, but that don't mean anything because I'm not a kid anymore. Not everybody starts their journey in a denomination, in, in an organization, in a, in a uh, uh, vein of teaching and necessarily maintains that entire uh, vein of teaching throughout the remainder of their whole life. No, I started my journey in life in a Trinitarian Pentecostal church. I grew up in that environment. But as time went on, there were things that I had to reckon with. There were doctrines and truths concerning the oneness of God. Jesus named baptism. Acts 2.38 salvation that I had to look at and I had to study and I had to consider. And as an adult, I had to decide whether or not it was incumbent upon me to make a change. And I made a change. One of the most foolish excuses used by believers to justify bad behavior is the practice of referencing the truth that the Lord never changes. He is consistent. He is constant. He is unchanging. But to try and use this fact as justification for our remaining stuck on a position or stuck upon a way of doing things or seeing things is folly. Do we dare claim that we are as perfect, all-knowing, and fully understanding as is the Lord? We are ever-changing because we haven't the capability of ever catching up with Jesus. Yes, He is forever the same. But we cannot afford to be the same today as we were yesterday and the same tomorrow as we were today. The moment we stop growing, maturing, and changing, we are stagnant and we are dead. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul appealed to the church at Corinth 
in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. 1 Peter 2, 1 and 3, Peter writes, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. You're not supposed to get the Word of God so you can stay the same, think the same, be the same. You're supposed to get the Word of God so you can grow mm -hmm. thereby. If so be, Peter said, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, the Apostle Paul articulates to the church at Ephesus the purpose of ministry and offices within the church. He said, and he, meaning God, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till... Till. Now, in the King James, they use the word till. We would say until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So God's given us the fivefold ministry to help teach us and to help us learn and to help us understand and to help us grow until we all finally come in the unity of the faith to the full stature of Jesus. Are, are you fool enough to think you've already gotten there? Are you foolish enough to believe for one second that you've already achieved that? Paul goes on to say in verse 14, Ephesians 4, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him, in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working, in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body, growing unto the edifying of itself in love." Paul said one of the purposes of the ministry is the perfecting of the saints. Does that mean so that you might be perfect, so you might be faultless, so you might be... No, no, no. The term that is used, uh, perfecting or perfect, is actually from the Greek word teleos. Telios, when the word perfect is used in relationship to human beings, to men, this is what it means. It means to be full grown, adult, of full age, and mature. Isn't that what we're talking about today? You gotta grow up. You gotta start thinking like an adult. You gotta start acting like an adult. You gotta start uh, talking like an adult. You gotta start understanding like an adult. A foolish believer is one who thinks that in this life he or she will have attained all knowledge, conquered all understanding, embraced all wisdom, and achieved perfection. That is not how the process of salvation and redemption works. As mature children of God, we understand that we're always changing. We're always growing. We're always maturing because we are always short of the glory of God in 
this life. But thank God He's promised a day when we will become what we today aspire to be. In 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, Peter writes, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts or desires in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, meaning conduct or behavior. Conversation means conduct or behavior. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. In Matthew 5, 43 through 48, Jesus said, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Again, the term perfect here is teleos, meaning to be full grown, adult, of full age, mature. So it's only a foolish believer who thinks that they've got it all, that they've wrapped it all up. Amen. Let me tell you in Acts chapter 18 verses 24 through 26. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom, when Aquila and Priscilla, friends of the Apostle Paul, had heard, they took him unto them, listen, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Oh, I'm not supposed to change. I'm Baptist. I'm supposed to be Baptist till the day I die. I'm supposed to believe what I believed growing up as a kid till the day I die. No, you ain't. No. Apollos was an eloquent man. Apollos was a well-learned man. Apollos was a sincere man. He was a devout man. He had a lot of energy. He had a lot of zeal. But he also had a limited knowledge of the gospel. The only baptism that Apollos knew anything about was the baptism of John. Honey, the gospel of Jesus Christ had moved well past the baptism of John. He was out preaching. You see, Apollos didn't wait in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost to receive the Holy Ghost. That's why he was out preaching, and he missed that. Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father come upon you. And they were supposed to wait in Jerusalem first to be empowered of the Holy Ghost. Then they'd know what to teach and what to preach and what to say. But Apollos was the first Baptist in the world, literally. He was the first Baptist. And he's out there preaching and teaching a gospel, and all he knows is the baptism of John. 
Priscilla and Aquila, they hear him teaching, and they say, oh, no, 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 no. He, he hadn't heard about Jesus' name, baptism. He hadn't heard about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We need to take this boy aside. And how does the Word of God describe it? They expounded to him the way of, uh, of the gospel more perfectly, more completely. Oh, children, I'm going to tell you, people change. If you're not changing, something's wrong with you. If you're not learning and growing and maturing and doing things differently today than you did yesterday, then something is wrong. Listen now. In Acts 19, just the next chapter from what I've just read to you, verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Who did Paul find? He found people who had believed on Jesus Christ through the ministry of Apollos. Finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Since ye believed. And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, What did Apollos teach? John's baptism. And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12. People change. They started out Baptists. Mm -hmm. They started out having only a limited understanding. Does that mean they had no truth? Does that mean they had no understanding or any revelation? No, not at all. But Priscilla and Aquila had to take Apollos and explain things to him more perfectly, more completely, more fully. Because he only had, that's why we call what we preach today the full gospel. It's not part of the gospel, it's the full gospel. You hear of churches that are called full gospel. That means they're Pentecostal. They believe in the full gospel message, including the baptism of the Holy Ghost. People change, Tommy. It's part of growth. It's part of maturing. It's part of becoming more today than we were yesterday. If you're alive, you're growing. You're changing. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. we got to be careful about getting it in our head that we've attained more than we've attained, and we've got more than we've got, and we understand more than we genuinely understand, that we're more mature than we really are. I'm going to tell you, when I was 20, I thought I knew everything there was to know. By the time I hit 30, I thought when I was 20, I was an idiot. By the time I hit 40, I thought when I was 30, I was an idiot. Now that I'm 55, I look back to when I was 50 and I think I was an idiot. Do you understand what I'm telling you now? Because the more you grow, the more you mature, the more you develop, the more you understand, suddenly you're able to look back and realize, boy, I thought I had it all. I thought I knew it all. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of believers today. They run around this life thinking they know everything there is to know about everything. And bless God, I don't have to re-examine the issue of LGBT. I don't have to 
re-examine the issue of divorce. I don't have to re-examine the issue of suicide. I don't have to re-examine this or that issue. Because I know what the Bible says. I know what the Word of God teaches. Honey, it don't ever hurt you to look into something a little more deeply. It never hurts you. If you're right, you're going to stay right. But if you're wrong, you're going to be challenged. It took me years before some of these issues got challenged in my own life. And when all of a sudden I was faced with the challenge of looking into these things more carefully and more perfectly, all of a sudden I realized, my Lord have mercy, did I have it wrong? Did I have it wrong? My God, my understanding was so wrong. The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest men ever to live, almost done today, writer of two-thirds of the New Testament canon, writes in Philippians 3 and 12, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, what do we say perfect meant? Mature, complete, grown. He said, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He said, I'm in pursuit of it. Amen. He said, I don't dare stand here and suggest that I've already attained it, but I'm in pursuit of it. That's why the word of God tells us to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It does not say walk in holiness. It does not say be holy. It says follow peace with all men and holiness. Pursue these things. Because unless you're pursuing these things, you will not see the Lord. It's not a matter of having apprehended them. But it is a matter, as Paul stated, he said, but... I am in pursuit. I follow after. In 2 Peter 3, 13 through 18, Peter again writes, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, Speaking in them of these things, in which are some things, listen, Peter said, of, in which are some things hard to be understood. So Peter even acknowledges there are some things that aren't altogether easy to grasp and aren't altogether easy to understand. Listen, he said, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, meaning wrestle with, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, Fall from your own steadfastness. But listen, verse number 18, 2 Peter 3. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Peter says, but grow in grace. And in the knowledge. Got news for you, honey. If you're growing, you're not going to be the same today as you were yesterday. And you won't be the same tomorrow as you were today. Hallelujah. If you're growing in the grace and in the knowledge, you're going to experience change. Lastly, in 1 John 3, verse 2, John, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, writes these words. Dear friends, now... We are the children of God, 
And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. People change. Hallelujah. We're going to be changed. Because no matter how much change occurs in our lives, in this world, we'll never be like him. The only way we'll ever be like him is when he appears. We shall be like him. Why? Because we shall see him as he is. Until that transpires, we're always in the process of growth. We're always in the process of maturing. We're always in the process of change. Can people change? Not only is the answer yes, but the answer to this other question, should people change? Yes. Amen. Amen. People change. Would you stand with me this afternoon?